Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany months before Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in as President of the United States. During the 1930s, while the United States primarily dealt with the Great Depression and the New Deal, Hitler was consolidating his power and rebuilding Germany. As soon as the Treaty of Versailles restrictions began to expire, Hitler began to rebuild the army. Weapons and to build up the army and prepare for war. He also signed a mutual agreement pact with Japan. So he was preparing and rebuilding German armaments. 1937 was something of a turning point because the vast majority of Americans did not want any involvement in overseas wars. Congress passed a Neutrality Act that pretty much hand handcuffed Roosevelt even if he'd wanted to do something. So when the Japanese invaded China and sank one of our ships, he couldn't do anything but write a letter of protest. In Germany, they were continuing to build up their forces and Britain tried to stop them with a negotiated treaty at Munich, but basically that just gave Hitler free reign to do what he wanted. And so the Japanese are getting aggressive and invading, the Germans are building up their military and the United States does nothing. In 1938, Hitler begins to retake the territory that was stripped from Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. He invades Austria and under the Munich Agreement, he has free reign to do what he wants. He also begins the roundup of Jews in the beginning of the Holocaust in the so-called Night of Broken Glass because when his forces had completed their uh, roundup of some Jews in some areas. They'd broken all the windows and the streets were littered with glass. Still by 1939, America does not want to get involved. So Germany invades Poland. And with that, France and England and the Soviet Union declare war on Germany and its allies, Italy and Japan. However, Germans' forces are so great that they drive the French and British troops to the sea, have them trapped at Dunkirk, and just a miracle saves the British Army and some of the French Army. The German Army has the British Army surrounded on the shores at Dunkirk, and they're about to wipe them out. Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, mobilizes everything that will float across the English Channel, sends boats over, and rescues the British Army from the shores of France. When Paris falls to the Germans in June 1940 and the French have to surrender, Hitler is so obsessed with the unfairness of the Treaty of Versailles that he sends his troops to find the railroad car where Germany had been forced to sign the surrender after World War I. He brings that railroad car to Paris and forces the French to sign their surrender in that very same railroad car. With the surrender of France, Germany by the beginning of 1941, controls virtually all of Europe with the exception of the British Isles and the western part of the Soviet Union. With the fall of France, Great Britain begins to prepare for a German invasion of the British Isles. They set up their defenses along the uh, shores and they begin to really prepare 
to try to repel a German invasion. By September 1940, Germany has began, begun an air attack on Great Britain to soften them up for the invasion. However, Hitler believes that until he has air superiority, he cannot invade. Therefore, the British Air Force must be overcome, and Hitler can never do that. The Battle of Britain is a uh, battle of airplanes, of air warfare, and Hitler does not succeed and therefore cannot invade Great Britain. President Roosevelt realizes that if Germany takes Britain, they will come after the United States next. But the American people do not want to get involved in World War II, and therefore his hands are pretty well tied. The neutrality acts that Roosevelt had been forced to sign because of public opinion prohibit the United States from delivering war material to countries at war. This is partially a reaction to the unrestricted submarine warfare that got us into World War I when American cargo ships were attacked. Therefore, Roosevelt begins to look for ways around this prohibition. He seeks out what is called cash and carry. Countries that are not involved in the war, who we can then loan money to and deliver armaments to, and they will then send them on to England and France. Canada is a good example. Canada is not officially declared war on Germany. Therefore, we can loan them money, sell them arms on credit, that they can put on Canadian ships to take to England. This is cash and carry. And a, one of the means that Roosevelt uses to try to help Great Britain stop the German invasion. Roosevelt gets Congress to pass the so-called Lend-Lease Act that allows him to lend or lease armaments to Great Britain. Kind of like you lease your car and then turn it in. Well, in a war, if you lease a tank, it's probably going to get blown up. But that's not the point. The point is that Roosevelt was looking for any way possible to help Great Britain stop Germany. And in the next video, it will explain more about this Lend-Lease program. American industry is ramping up to provide materials of war, and Roosevelt uses Lend-Lease to supply arms, not just to Great Britain, but to all of the allies fighting against the Axis powers, to Russia, to Australia, to China. And so we begin to be the supplier of armaments and of food and of oil and other necessities for making war to the Allied forces. Opposition to World War II and American involvement pretty much disappears after December 7, 1941, when the Japanese pull off a surprise aerial bombardment of the U U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Immediately, Roosevelt goes to Congress to ask for a declaration of war, first against Japan and then against Germany. The next video is his war speech.
Why Jap Japan attacked at Pearl Harbor? There are a number of reasons. We had been in conflict with Japan for several years. The Harley-Smoot tariff had hurt trade. They saw themselves as the emperors or rulers of the Far East, and that was in direct competition with the American open door policy. Remember that Japan is a, a series of islands. They do not have natural resources. They must get them from someplace else. It's one of the reasons they invaded China was to get the resources to build their military. Because of their actions in China, which were by all accounts barbaric, attacks on civilians and that sort of thing, Franklin Roosevelt begins to embargo sending goods to Japan, things like oil, things like scrap iron, that are necessary for them to continue their military buildup. Also, he ordered the American fleet to move from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor in anticipation of perhaps having to go to war to stop Japan. All these reasons led to Japan to the conclusion that if they took out the Pacific fleet, the United States would be hampered from stopping their ambitions in the Far East for at least 10 years. That was not the case. Japanese officers who were familiar with the American industrial might warned against it. And so while the attack was uh, damaging, American industry sprung into action and we recovered from the attack much more quickly than the Japanese had anticipated. As is my custom, I'm not going to fight the battles of World War II. We know the outcome. Virtually from the U.S. entrance, the tide of war began to change because of our industrial might. It was our industry providing the tools of war as much, if not more, than American troops that turned the tide of the war. The Russians who were under attack wanted the United States to immediately attack France. But Roosevelt and Winston Churchill recognized that American armed forces were not good enough to take on Germany directly. Therefore, we began our attacks in North Africa, moved up through Italy, and ultimately retook Paris and moved into Germany. By September 1943, Italy surrendered and a mob of angry Italians killed their Nazi leader, Mussolini. So the beginning of the freeing of Europe took a big step with the conquering of Italy. D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944, U.S. and British forces in the largest amphibious assault in the history of warfare. Storm ashore at Normandy in France and begin to push the, Brit the German army back. Now, in a way, the Americans had fooled Hitler. He thought that the invasion would come at the Pas de Calais. And using a fake army made up with balloons and plywood and stuff like that, the Americans and the British fooled him into thinking that Normandy was just 
a, a fake. The real invasion was coming someplace else. So he held back his troops. Therefore, the British and the Americans were able to take the beaches at Normandy, begin to move inland, and by the time they were had gotten Hitler reacted, the Americans and the British had already established a beachhead from which Hitler could not remove them. With the invasion at Normandy, Hitler now had to fight both in on the Western Front against the British and the Americans, and on the Eastern Front against the Russians. Therefore, he had to divide his forces. This helped both sides to be able to close in on Germany. And ultimately, the Russian army took Berlin. The American army took most of the rest of Germany until Germany had to surrender in what was called VE Day or Victory in Europe Day. While the U.S. was fighting in Europe, it was also fighting in the Pacific. It adopted a strategy called island hopping. The purpose of this was to establish Air Force bases closer and closer and closer to Japan so that ultimately airplanes could fly and bomb Japan and return to base. To do this, many of the famous battles of the Pacific, Wake Island, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, took place as the United States would take an island, then establish an, air, uh, an airfield from which ultimately they could bomb Japan. The original island hopping strategy was to get airfields close enough to Japan to be able to bomb Japan in anticipation of an invasion. However, during the war, the Manhattan Project had been started to try to see if they could figure out how to make an atomic bomb. By 1945, the Manhattan Project had succeeded and the first atomic test had taken place. Now it was a question, are we going to use the atomic bomb? Franklin Roosevelt had died, Harry Truman was now the president, and he decided to use the atomic bomb against Japan. It was estimated that it would cost a million, a minimum of a million casualties to invade the island of Japan because they had a warrior mentality. They had demonstrated this on the islands that we had taken. They would rather die than surrender. And therefore Truman, primarily to save American lives, decided to use the atomic bomb on Japan. The first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and this is what the city of Hiroshima looked like after that one bomb. Then the United States let Japan know that we would continue to do this if they did not surrender. Japan refused to surrender, and therefore we dropped the second atomic bomb. The second atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki. This is what was left of the entire city after the bomb. The second bomb convinced the Japanese emperor to surrender, despite his military's want, wanting to continue the war. The emperor decides to surrender, and it's a good thing because we had used both the bombs we had. We didn't have any more atomic bombs at that point in time, but the emperor didn't know that. 
and therefore Japan surrenders. The surrender of Japan or the victory in J over Japan, VJ Day, is celebrated throughout the United States. The war is over. As I mentioned, American industrial might won World War II just as much as our brave troops did. You can see here a list of how we just outproduced everybody, airplanes, ships, aircraft carriers, the tools of war. Sometimes it must have seemed to the Japanese or to the Germans that every time they shot down an American plane, two more popped up, kind of like a shooting gallery. That's how fast we were making these tools of war. And it was largely due to the Office of War Mobilization, which, like in World War I, had taken over American industry and, and taught, told different industries, what they were to make, how much they were to make, all that kind of thing. Now, there are a million interesting stories about what went on during World War II. Let me just highlight a couple of three important moves. First was Roosevelt's Executive Order 8802, in which for the first time, the United States government said that it, industry could not discriminate because of race. If you wanted to be involved in producing goods for war for the United States government, you could not discriminate. Now, how strictly this was enforced, that's a whole nother question. But we have for the first time, the United States government saying, you cannot discriminate because of race. You have the fascinating story of the Navajo code talkers, Navajo Indians. Apparently their language is so complex that if you're not a native speaker, you cannot learn the language. And so we used that. We sent them into the front lines to report back on what was going on. They wouldn't have to code anything wouldn't take time to code stuff, send it, decode it. They could just talk. And so this quickly sped up American response on the battlefield by using these heroic Native Americans. You probably know the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. The movie Red Tails was based on them. These were African Americans who were trained to fly and maintain airplanes. Now the racial bias at the time said African-Americans are not intelligent enough to handle complex machinery. But Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin's wife, pushed him to do the experiment because she believed they would prove they were not only intelligent enough, but would make fantastic pilots. And so Tuskegee was set up as an experiment. And boy, did they succeed. They became one of the most honored uh, air combat groups in all of the Army Air Corps and proved the falsehood that African Americans cannot do complicated tasks. The contributions of Hispanic Americans, particularly Mexican Americans, in the war is a little bit harder to trace than that of African Americans, because African Americans were still segregated. African Americans were now in their own companies, in their own divisions. Whereas Hispanic 
Americans, Mexican Americans, served throughout the armed forces. And yet, we know of heroic deeds. We had five Mexican Americans from Texas who were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Another story from World War II that we must acknowledge was the treatment of Japanese Americans. This is one of the low points in American history. The American government rounded up Japanese Americans, forced them out of their homes and into internment camps, as they were called, prison camps. Now, we didn't go as far as the, uh, the Germans with the Holocaust, but they were ripped away from their homes, their businesses. They were forced to leave all of their goods that they could not carry with them behind and were held prisoners. Ultimately, some young Japanese American men were allowed to join the military, but only for service in Europe, not in service in the Pacific, where perhaps their language skills could have been a big plus, but that was not allowed. You all know about the Holocaust, murder of more than six million Jews by the Germans. They would round up the Jews, take them to places like Dachau, kill them in gas chambers, extract the gold from their teeth to help finance the war, and then burn their bodies. If you are not familiar with the Holocaust, the Holocaust Museum in Dallas is a great visit. You need to know the story of hatred, of racism. And so I urge you, if you don't know the Holocaust story, to find out more about it. On the home front, as the men went off to serve in the war, women more and more replaced them in virtually all kinds of jobs. I love this quote from Newsweek magazine because it sounds kind of like, who knew women could do all this stuff? They could be electricians and not that sort of thing because they had never been allowed to do it before. But women were urged to get involved in what was called war work. And they responded. In fact, there was a whole publicity campaign directed at women to encourage them to get out and do it, do the uh, work in industry, to do the work on the farms. This is Rosie the Riveter, perhaps the most famous, iconic picture used in that campaign saying, women, we can do it. We can support the war effort by learning how to rivet, how to plow, how to weld, how to drive buses, how to fly airplanes. We can do it. We can make a difference in this war by getting involved in war work. And the women of the country responded learning these skills that were supposedly just manly skills, like being able to weld, being able to build ships using rivets. The government also put rations on all kinds of goods that could be used in the war, on gasoline, on food. You could not buy food without a coupon from your ration book. And Americans were encouraged to help fight the war by abiding by the law. If you weren't entitled to buy a pound of sugar, then you didn't buy a pound of sugar. If you weren't entitled to a gallon of gasoline, then you didn't buy a, a gallon of gasoline. 
the American people were encouraged to help win the war. This is one of my favorite posters. When you ride alone, you help Hitler because you're wasting gas. You're not helping defeat Hitler, you are helping Hitler. So don't drive alone, car share, walk, whatever it takes, because every gallon of gas you save is one that can be used to defeat Germany. The same kind of citizen involvement also applied to food. Don't waste food, grow your own food so that the food that is being grown commercially can be sent to help fight the war. And this depiction of using a shovel to save food to be able to ship overseas is a prime example of the government's propaganda efforts to let everyone know that they contributed to winning the war. At home, you contributed to winning the war by not going on the black market and buying goods that you were not entitled to because of rationing. Pay legal prices, give up your coupons, and you're good. But if you go outside the law to the black market, you are helping Germany and Japan win the war. You didn't have to be a Rosie the Riveter, if you were a woman, to help win the war. All you had to do was find a job that you fit best, in industry, in agriculture, in business, whatever it took. By doing so, you were helping the United States win the war. All your actions on the home front helped to keep your husbands, your brothers, your fathers safe in fighting the war. Keep them flying by doing your war work and doing it well. Don't skimp, don't cut corners, because if you do, you could cost your husband, your brother, your father, his life because they got defective equipment. Farm women were encouraged to take over the operation of the farm when their brothers, their husbands, their fathers went off to war. You need to learn how to plow, how to plant, how to cultivate, how to harvest the crops. This was all part of your duty to win the war. In short, everyone on the home front was made to feel like they were contributing to winning the war. Think about it for a second. We've been in a war in Afghanistan for what, 14 years. Unless you've had somebody serve, how many sacrifices have you made for that war effort? My guess is not many. You haven't missed a tank of gas or a steak or whatever. During World War II, it, one of the government's primary goals was to make every American feel like that they had a way to contribute to winning the war. No, they might not carry a gun, but in their work, in their conserving everything, they were helping to win the war. And that was the message that the government got out and that most Americans not only believed, but abided by. Another way the citizens at home were encouraged to support the war effort was by buying war bonds. Again, these basically are loans to the federal government. You buy a bond, and then when it matures, you get the, the amount you paid for the bond plus interest. You're floating the 
federal government a loan by buying war bonds. And there were huge rallies to encourage people to buy war bonds. This was seen as part of your patriotic duty to support the war. As we see today, back during World War II, celebrities pitched in to do their part, visiting the wounded, for example, or putting on shows. The Hollywood Canteen was famous. You could, a serviceman in uniform could go in there and get free food and perhaps even get to dance with a Hollywood star. Stars also took their uh, acts on the road to the troops. Mickey Rooney was famous for going out and riding around in a Jeep until he found a group of, of soldiers and then he'd stop and just tell jokes and, and talk with them and stuff like that in small groups. Comedian Bob Hope put together complete floor shows with band and uh, dancing girls and all that kind of thing and entertained thousands of troops during the war. You could drive through neighborhoods and see these little flags hanging on a door or in a window. They showed how many service people from that household were in the military. Blue stars were for people who were active military. Gold star was how many people in that family had been killed in the war. This is where we get the term gold star mother. So the bottom line on the home front was that everybody had responsibilities. And here's a checklist of what the patriotic citizen at home was expected to do. Find time for war work. Share food, raise your own food. Walk, don't waste gasoline. Conserve everything you have. And buy war bonds. This was the duty of the patriotic American. As the war began to turn in the favor of the Allies, the leaders of the countries began to hold meetings to discuss how to uh, administer the defeated countries after the war. The first of these conferences was in Tehran in 1943, and the leaders of the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and the United States met to discuss once the war is over, what are we going to do? The next major meeting was at Yalta. The three leaders of the big three, that is Joseph Stalin on the right, Franklin Roosevelt in the middle, Winston Churchill on the left. And they began to put down specific plans for how to administer a defeated Germany. What they agreed on was to divide Germany into different zones, a French zone, an American zone, a Russian zone, and a British zone. Those countries would have the administrative authority to set up new governments and to govern the defeated land. It was also agreed that once governments had been reestablished, that the occupying forces would be withdrawn. The major points at Yalta, Germany must surrender unconditionally. There would be no terms. The Germany would be administered by the big four powers. The powers and occupying armies would be withdrawn after the governments were reestablished without the Nazis. And that within 60 days of Germany's surrender, 
the Soviet Union would enter the war against Japan to help the United States and Britain fight to end the war in the Pacific. The final meeting of the big three countries was at Potsdam. But you'll notice in this picture that things have changed. Joseph Stalin is still there, but Franklin Roosevelt has died and Harry Truman is the president of the United States. And Winston Churchill was defeated in election re-election bid for prime minister. And so he had been replaced. These three brought a little bit different attitude to the Potsdam Conference. Potsdam was not a very friendly meeting. They still agreed on a few things, on the different zones for administering Germany, that the occupying armies would withdraw once governments were established. They also decided that there would be war crimes in light of the Holocaust. But you'll notice that missing from this list is that the Soviet Union would come into the war against Japan. There's a reason for that. While at Potsdam, President Truman found out about the successful test of the atomic bomb. And therefore, he did not feel like he needed the Soviet Union to defeat Japan and he wanted to keep them out because the Soviet Union had a bad reputation from Western point of view of not abiding by its agreements. And so Truman was beginning to move at Potsdam because of the atomic bomb away from cooperation with the Soviet Union. The results of World War II, first of all, ended the Great Depression. The massive government spending on the war put everybody back to work. The United States emerged as a world superpower, eclipsing Britain and France. It centralized American media in New York City and government in Washington, D.C. Because of our superpower status, that would require a larger military and therefore more defense spending. It also started what became known as the Cold War, and we will talk much more about that in a minute. To compensate the soldiers who fought in the war, Congress passed the GI Bill, which gave benefits to veterans benefits like low-cost housing mortgages, free schooling, and stuff like that. And the threat that still hangs over us today but came out of World War II is the threat of the atomic bomb. A couple of other results growing out of World War II was the establishment of the United Nations with the United States as a participating leading member of that organization. It sought to do many of the things like the League of Nations had, but it would to provide a place for negotiation between the nations rather than warfare. Another event that emerged in the aftermath of World War II was the founding of the State of Israel. In May 1946, the Israelis drove out the British who had been occupying Palestine at that time and declared part of Palestine as the State of Israel. The United States almost immediately recognized them as a new nation. This is the source of some of our problems in the Middle East to this day, as the Palestinians have always felt like that the Israelis stole their land and therefore have been at perpetual war with 
Jews and the state of Israel ever since. One of the results of World War II was the beginning of the Cold War, a global contest between the West and the East, between the United States-led Western democracies and the Soviet-led Eastern dictatorships, communism. And we'll talk about a number of the, uh, the differences and why there is such animosity, why each side distrusted the other. But first, let's watch a video to shows how the Cold War had its roots clear back in the Russian Revolution when the United States tried to help defeat the communists in Russia. The American view during the Cold War was that Russia, the Soviet Union, was trying to take over the world. To carry out Karl Marx's pre uh, prediction of worldwide communist revolution. And so the United States decided we've got to stop the spread of communism. The United States did not trust the Soviet Union for a number of reasons. Number one, communism and capitalism are diametrically opposed economic systems. So are dictatorship and democracy. The United States believed that the Soviet Union was trying to cause worldwide revolution, to overthrow the capitalist class and create a world communism. The Soviet Union did not live up to their agreements at Pot from Potsdam and Yalta to withdraw their troops once governments were reestablished in Eastern Europe. In fact, their military stayed there, occupied Eastern European countries, and they established communist governments in those countries that were propped up by the Soviet Union. And finally, after the war, there were communist revolts around the world, particularly in Greece, Turkey, and China. The United States saw this as attempts to subvert democratic governments around the world and blamed it on the communists. And so for these reasons, the United States felt like they had to stop the spread of communism without war. From the Soviet point of view, the United States were the one trying to take over the world and enslave the workers of the world to the capitalists. The Soviet Union had a growing distrust of the United States. After all, Wilson had sent American aid to try to defeat the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. It had failed to recognize communist Soviet Union for more than 10 years after they won the revolution. The U.S. had not helped the USSR, in fact, had worked against it. The United States had refused to allow the USSR to have a role in governing Italy after we defeated it, saying, Soviet Union, you did not help defeat Italy, and therefore you should not have part of the government. The United States had <clears throat> developed the atomic bomb in a joint effort with England, but the Soviet Union was also our ally during World War II, and we had purposely cut them out of information about the development of the atomic bomb. <clears throat> they felt this was a betrayal. And then, of course, you have the basic philosophical con conflict between communism and capitalism, between dictatorship and democracy, between a government top-down control of the people 
and people controlling the government. Now, to make sure we're talking apples and apples, I want to make sure everybody understands about ca capitalism and communism. Capitalism is <clears throat> free enterprise. It is the managers and the owners of companies getting the most rewards from the profits of those companies. <clears throat> In this sense, the workers are secondary to the management and capitalist class. And therefore, you have <clears throat> freedom to innovate, but you do not have equality with the workers. Under communism, in theory, the government owns everything, all of the factories, all of the farms, everything, all of the housing. And then the government supposedly on an equitable basis distributes the labor and distributes the profits from that labor to the laborers. Now, communism has never worked as the theory projects, but it was very easy to sell. Communism is about the workers, not about the factory owners, because under communism, the state owns the factories. The first skirmishes of the Cold War are depicted here. The disagreements at, Yats at Yalta and Potsdam. The attempts at Soviet takeover in Greece, which was met by what became known as the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, and ultimately came to a head-to-head -head confrontation over Berlin. The Cold War was really about who's on our team. Spheres of influence, as it's called. Which country is going to side with us? Which country is going to side with the bad guys? And there was really a lot of blind uh, spots in this for countries that just wanted to be their own country and did not want to be for either side. Both sides pushed countries to into alliances with them. In the case of the Soviet Union, they often used force to take over countries and then install puppet communist governments. The United States was much more about using economic power and influence to win people or to win countries to the American side. So in many ways, the Cold War was a war of propaganda, not bullets and, and shooting and armies in the field. That would be a hot war. But in the, in the propaganda wars, the West always depicted communism as getting, once it gets its tentacles into some country, then it's going to corrupt that country and suck it into communism. That was how the propaganda of the West worked. Any intrusion by communism was a potential disaster. As for the Soviet propaganda, it depicted America's attempts to quote, help unquote, other countries, foreign aid, this kind of thing, as really just uh, disguising the true intentions of the United States, and that was to take over the world and to enslave workers under the thumb of the owners of businesses and corporations. And so the propaganda of the Soviet Union was you cannot trust the United States, no matter how generous they might be, because they're merely, merely trying to buy your soul. <clears throat> 
As the Cold War developed, it basically broke into the two sides, the West, the United States and its allies, democratic republics, capitalist economies, versus the Soviet Union and communism and dictatorship. But there was a lot of the world that was in neither camp. Much of Southeast Asia, much of the Middle East, Africa, and South and Central America. And it's in these areas then that we have the real contest to attract countries to your side is in what was called the third world, the non-industrialized parts of the world. In many ways, American policy in the Cold War had started with Kennan's long telegram. George Kennan was an ambassador to the Soviet Union from the United States. And he sent a telegram back to Washington that outlined what he saw as the true goals of communism. That the, you know, the Russians, Soviet Union, saw themselves at perpetually at war against capitalism. That social democracies were not good that the Marxist should be the controlling of the world and that Soviet aggression was fundamentally aligned with the leaders of Russia, not the people of Russia. And therefore, if you could undermine the leaders, the people would rise up and demand democracy. This became kind of the basis for American foreign policy for decades to come. Kennan's long telegram led to what became known as the Truman Doctrine, which was the basis of American Cold War strategy until the 1970s and 80s. First of all, it was a policy that the United States should support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by outside forces or internal rebellion. So we should help any country trying to maintain democracy. We must assist free people to allow them to work out their own destinies and that Truman believed this help would come primarily in the forms of economic and financial aid, not in military terms. This part would change, but initially that's what he believed, that if the booming U.S. economy could provide financial aid to these countries at risk of going communist, that would tip the scales in favor of the United States. Truman believed that totalitarianism, communism flourished where people were poor. And therefore we should help grow the economies of countries so that people were not in poverty because that would give them hope. As he said, we must keep hope alive. He believed that only people who lacked hope for their future would resort to communism. Partially as part of Cold War propaganda, Truman issued his famous executive order 9981 that integrated the armed services. Southerners in Congress refused to allow this. So he used his power as commander in chief of the military to order the integration of the American military. Partially, this was because 
the Soviet Union had begun using treatment of African Americans in the United States as propaganda against democracy, saying, hey, it's supposed to be a democracy, but look at the way African Americans are treated in America. They're treated as second class citizens. They're lynched. They're uh, abused. Is that the kind of government you want? Come over to communism where everybody is equal. And so this propaganda began to paint a bad image, particularly in Africa and South America, for the United States. So partially, Truman was influenced by this propaganda war, this Cold War, to integrate the American Armed Services. Winston Churchill made a speech at Fulton, Missouri, in which he said an iron curtain had descended across Europe. And so from then on, the division between countries controlled by the Soviet Union and countries who were allied with the United States, France, and Great Britain for democracy and, and uh, capitalism, the dividing line of that in Europe became known as the Iron Curtain. And you see it depicted here, where the Soviet Union just it kind of stops there after the Eastern European countries that they had taken over at the end of World War II. At the beginning of the Cold War, the United States had a huge advantage. We were the only country with the atomic bomb. Stalin had planned to send the Russian army on into Western Europe to take over Western Europe until he found out we had the bomb and would use it. That forced him to recalculate because he knew if he sent a conventional army storming into Europe, we could just nuke them. And they didn't have any response. So it was the atomic bomb in the early days of the Cold War that restrained the Soviet Union and caused it to find other ways to try to spread communism. In line with Truman's beliefs that it was economics that would determine whether a country stayed capitalist or went communist, he devised the Marshall Plan. This was basically a plan to rebuild all of Europe, providing millions and millions of dollars in aid for Europe to be able to rebuild after the war, including Germany. And so the Marshall Plan became the essence of Truman's attempts to stop the spread of communism. The video that follows will explain more about the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine. The American strategy in fighting the Cold War was called containment, that we must stop the spread of communism so that it got, did not gain one more inch of control in the world. And therefore, we felt it was our duty to go and stop the spread of communism. Part of this was based on what became known as the domino theory in Southeast Asia. The theory that if one country fell to communism, then it would cause its neighbor to fall to communism, would call its neighbor to, call, to fall to communism, and so forth and so on, falling like a series of dominoes. And so the containment theory said, basically, we've got to stop that first domino from falling. Because if we don't, it could lead to a whole cascade of countries falling to communism. The United States felt like it was doing a pretty good job of containing communism 
until 1949. And then three major events took place that shook the United States to its core and left it questioning, how are we gonna win this Cold War? First of all, in Berlin, the city had been divided into four ge uh, geographic governing regions. The Soviet Union tried to force the United States, France, and England out of Berlin in the belief that if they controlled Berlin, then they would control all of Germany. Secondly, the United States or the Soviet Union tested successfully its first atomic bomb. So now the United States was not the only atomic power in the world. And this sets off a decades of an arms race when it comes to nuclear weapons. And third, in 1949, the communists under Mao Zedong take control of China and force the, support, the American supported Chinese Republic off the coast onto an island. And so a domino falls. China becomes a communist country. As part of the Potsdam and Yalta agreements, the capital of Germany, Berlin, had been divided into four sections, the U.S. section, the English section, the French section, and the Soviet section. But Berlin sits right in the middle of the Soviet section of Germany. Therefore, to get supplies into Berlin, you had to go through the Soviet-controlled areas of the country of Germany, what would ultimately become known as East Germany. Then the Soviet Union tried to force the United States, France, and England out by shutting off all the supplies to the city. They were willing to starve the city to force the Americans out. And so this video describes the Berlin airlift, the American response to the Soviet attempt to blockade the city. Under the Potsdam Agreement, the United States and England and France had maintained air corridors across Soviet-held portions of Germany. And it was in these air corridors then that the United States undertook, with the help of England and France, to supply a city of a million people in Berlin by air. Now, they didn't have super, super big planes back then. And so they had to fly in and out, in and out. And they created in these air quarters kind of one-way streets. You would have two uh, quarters going into Berlin, one coming out. And for almost a year, the United States was able to supply the people of Berlin with everything from clothes to coal to heating oil. They even figured out a way to dismantle uh, road graders and uh, front end loaders, put them on a plane, and then reassemble them so they could build more airports in Berlin. But ultimately, they overcame the Soviet blockade, and this was considered then the first physical confrontation of the Cold War, and the Soviets backed down. China's fall to communism and to Mao Zedong was a shock to the United States because it meant that we had not contained communism. And the fear was that with China being communist, now you would have the rest of Southeast Asia becoming communist. And this then sets the stage for two major hot war conflicts that we have in Southeast Asia, the Korean War and Vietnam.
The United States felt that Soviet Union showed its true colors in not removing its troops from East Germany and then setting up a puppet government, the government of East Germany, to establish East Germany as a separate communist country rather than abiding by their agreement to withdraw from Germany once government was established. No, they took control, set up a pop, puppet government that was controlled by Moscow. And this was a signal to the United States that no compromise was possible with the Soviet Union. And you could not agree, cannot believe them if they made an agreement because they would violate that agreement. After World War II, Korea had been divided into in two. The Communist North, supported by the Chinese, and the Democratic South, supported by the United States. The North Koreans invaded South Korea, trying to reunify the country. The United States sent in troops to stop this invasion. And thus you get what becomes known as the Korean War. And ultimately, the United States would get into the war, would push the North Korean troops, supported by communist China, out of the South, and then begin to push them north. There were suggestions that we should go ahead and invade China. And take it over and change it from a communist government. But ultimately that was deemed to be not possible. So ultimately Korea becomes a stalemate. And in the early 1950s, a treaty is negotiated that leaves North and South Korea divided as it is to this day. So Korea is the first armed conflict of the Cold War. There's supposed to be a division at the 38th parallel. When the North Koreans violated that, the United States took, uh, put troops in there under the auspices of the United Nations. The United Nations declared North Korea to be the aggressors and told them to stop. And then the United Nations put together a force, primarily under the command of Americans, to stop the invasion. When the North Koreans were being pushed back towards the Chinese border, then China sent in troops to help the North Koreans. Ultimately, resulting in a treaty that stated that the 38th parallel was the dividing line between two separate countries, North Korea and South Korea. That was all part of the first armed conflict of the Cold War. 